The Buddha taught that we have basically two responses to the experience of pain. One is bewilderment. Why is this happening to us? And the other is a search. Is there somebody who knows a way to get past this pain? It's because of pain that we look for things in life. If we didn't have any pains at all, what would we search for? We'd be perfectly satisfied where we were. What would we have to think about? It's because we're bewildered the way I start thinking. But it's also because, because we're bewildered. We start thinking in ways that are actually harmful. And when our search is guided by bewilderment, we can come up with some people who have all kinds of ideas about why we're in pain, what we can do about it, whether we have to accept it, simply because that's the fact of nature, or accept it because it comes from some Creator God. Or that it's our punishment, whatever the explanation may be. And the Buddha offers his teaching as a response to cure that bewilderment and put it into the search. And we look at his teaching about why we have pain, why, especially if the mind has pain, why it suffers. And we can see why there's such an etiquette of respect around the teaching. As he said, if you really want to get the most out of the teaching, you can't despise the teacher, you can't despise the teaching, and you can't despise yourself. Because this attitude of respect for the teacher also includes respect for yourself. Because the Buddha is teaching you that the reason you're suffering, the reason the mind is suffering, is because of its clinging. Now the word for clinging can also mean the act of taking food, the act of taking sustenance. And he's saying something very radical there, that one of our activities that we most enjoy in life, which is a large part of our being a being, is taking in food. And yet this act is symbolic for all of our suffering. But he's saying, we can do it. We can learn how to put an end to that clinging, first by searching for the cause, which is craving, three kinds of craving, for sensuality, becoming, non-becoming. And then putting an end to the, the cause. So on the one hand, the truths he teaches go against the grain. And to be willing to accept them requires that we respect the teacher, respect what he has to say or she has to say. But we also realize these teachings are asking a lot of us, which means we have to have respect for our own ability to carry these things out. When the Buddha calls this a noble truth of suffering, he's not saying that suffering itself is noble, but he's saying adopting his perspective on suffering is what's noble, because you're taking responsibility for your own sufferings, and you're willing to step back from your urges, from your moods, from your likes and dislikes. And that's a noble act in the mind. So we approach the teachings with respect, because they're going to make us good people. Make us people worthy of respect. Because you look at most of the world, it's as if everybody believed that advertisement they had for Sprite years back was, Obey your thirst. Wherever you thirst, wherever you hunger, go for it. That seems to be the message of the world outside. But the Buddha is saying, no, this is why we suffer. Instead of just simply falling in with that activity, we have to step back and try to comprehend it. In other words, get to the point where we understand it so that we have no passion, aversion, or delusion around it. He said there are four kinds of clinging. We cling to five things. 
they're called aggregates, but the more activities form this body of ours which is constantly changing. Feeling, perception, thought fabrications, and consciousness. These are all activities that are involved in feel, feeding. The form is the form of the body and the form of the food we eat. Feeling and the feeling of hunger that drives us to, to eat. And our desire for that feeling of pleasure that comes when we're full. The perception of what kind of hunger we have, the perception of what kind of foods out there will satisfy our hunger. Fabrication, trying to figure out how to find that food, and then when we found it, how to fix it. And how to maintain a source of food that goes on into the future. And consciousness, your awareness of all these things. These are the activities that go into feeding. We identify ourselves with them. It's part of our being a being. And we cling to them in four ways. One, simply out of sensuality, the whatever sensual pleasure they can provide for us. Two, in terms of our views of the world, how the world works, what we need to do in order to find the food we want, the satisfaction we want. Three, our clinging to habits and practices once we have an idea that we're going to find happiness this way or that way, and we just hold on to it, whether it's working or not. And then the biggest clinging, of course, is our, our identifying with these things, either as what we are, or as something belonging to us, or that we're in them or they're in us. For example, you may have the idea that you are someplace in the body, or that you are in the infinite consciousness and the body is in you. These kinds of things. This is how we cling, and this is how we suffer. And again, we hold to these views very tightly. We hold to our ideas of the world, our ideas of what we should and shouldn't do, and who we are. We hold really tight. And so again, the Buddha is asking us to do something noble, to step back from these forms of clinging. The best way to do that, of course, is to see why we're clinging to begin with. And that's why we look at those three kinds of craving. Craving for sensuality. Craving for becoming, that's to take on an identity in a particular world. That identity focuses on a desire of any kind. And then there's the you who can bring the desired object about, and there's the you who's going to enjoy it once you found it. And then there's the you who's watching the other two senses of you to see how well they're doing, what they might do better. We call it the inner critic. That's an important part of your identification. And so in getting past these things, though, you can't just drop them. Buddha teaches us how to do them in better ways. After all, as we're on the path, we have to feed. This was the lesson he learned from his own experience with the austerities. He was going to starve himself. He almost starved himself to death, and he realized that was not the way. Then he realized that the way was going to involve right concentration, which required certain strength of the body, enough strength that required a certain amount of food, particularly learning how to feed the mind with right concentration, and then adopting new ways of clinging. Instead of looking for sensuality, you look for the pleasure of concentration. But you adopt views about how the world works in terms of how karma works, how causality works in such a way that you can have an understanding of patterns of cause and effect. There are tendencies in the world, but they're not ironclad and they're not deterministic. There's room for you to make changes. Views about what habits and practices are good to follow in terms of the precepts, in terms of the practice of concentration, and even yourself. 
You want to have a sense of self that is, feels that you're competent to do this and that you will enjoy it. And you have to train that inner critic to watch the other two. So it's not so critical that it's discouraging, but it holds you to a high standard. What kind of happiness will you find satisfactory? Here again, the Buddha is asking to be noble. He says the noble search is one that looks for something that's deathless, that's not subject to aging, illness, and death, and is not willing to settle for second best. And so this inner critic has to be encouraging. When the Buddha talks about, when the Buddha himself was giving Dharma talks, they say that he gave talks of four kinds, instructing, urging, rousing, and encouraging. Notice that four verbs. Only one is instructing, the other two basically giving you the energy you want to follow through, convincing you that, yes, you can do this. So here again, the Buddha is asking you to have respect for yourself. Don't underestimate your abilities. This is something you can do. So when you train these forms of clinging to be actually part of the path, as you develop virtue, concentration, and discernment, you have energy. You have confidence. This is another reason why we respect the Buddha, is he basically teaches us to respect ourselves, that this is something we can do. So it's all of a piece. Sometimes you hear people say, well, Buddhism is a nice philosophy, but don't know about the religious side. But this religious side, that side, the etiquette of respect, is an important part. It's an integral part of the practice. After all, the Buddha is teaching you to step back from something that's very intimate and you're very much attached to, the way you feed, physically and emotionally. So it's holding you to a high standard. And there'll be parts of the mind that resist. So to overcome that resistance, you have to remind yourself, okay, this really is a respectable, honorable path that we're taught here. So it's as the chant says, it's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. It starts with good principles and carrying through. You're not asked to do anything that's not noble. And the goal is the ultimate goal of any noble search. A happiness is totally harmless, a happiness is totally unchanging, totally free. So we hold the Buddha in high respect because he holds us to a high standard. And he solves that problem that we began with, our bewilderment over our pain and suffering and our search. And he turns our search into a noble search and puts an end to our bewilderment. So our respect is not respect out of fear, it's respect out of gratitude, that there is such a path. And there are people who went to all the trouble to keep it alive and open. And John Sowett made the comment one time. He said when someone has followed the path to the end, as they're following the path, they have to clear away the, the weeds and the obstacles. When they get to the end, as far as they're concerned, the path can overgrown with weeds again. But then they look and they see other people coming along the path. And there are also people putting obstacles in the path. And so out of compassion for the first group, they try to keep the path open. We're the beneficiaries of that. So always hold that thought in mind. <laughs>